Welcome to Fit Body Lifestyle, the show where we dive deep into the world of fitness, health, business, relationships, and the art of living a balanced life. I'm Jamie. And I'm Greg, and we're here to give you the benefit of our experiences in the fitness and bodybuilding industry, the corporate world, running a business, personal development, and building healthy relationships. Whether you're sweating it out in the gym, hustling in your business, or seeking balance in your everyday life, you're in the right place. So lace up those sneakers and grab that water bottle and let's get ready to transform our minds, our bodies, and our lives. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Fit Body Lifestyle. And of course, it's Mama Bear and Papa Bear here. And we got a very special guest today, Miss Jordan Brannon. Hi IFBB everybody. IFBB Pro. And um, before we get to the first question, which is just to tell us a little bit about yourself, let's start how we start all these conversations, which is, what's your check-in word for this conversation? My check-in word right now is excitement. I like that. We're then then we're all excited. Yes. I think that would be my check-in word as well. <laughs> would you tell everybody just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Um, I am 32 years old, and I am from Tampa, Florida. I just recently moved to Scottsdale, which is where we are right now, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, I moved here at the beginning of the year. This has been such a big transformation for me. I always said I was going to live in Florida my entire life. And it's been so awesome being in a new space and having a different mindset and everything like that. And we're so happy to have you. Thank you. Thank you. It's really good to be here. Um, obviously, I'm a coach for Fit Body Fusion. And before that, I was interested in being a physical therapist. Uh, my aunt um, back in Tampa, she we own three in our family. And that was kind of my calling for so many years. Um, I went to the University of South Florida, um, and that's where I did the exercise physiology program. And I also met my husband, Drew, there. Um, and I started realizing at that time that I didn't really want to do physical therapy, and I was more interested in the, the exercise side of things. Um, and then soon after, we we opened up our gym. Uh, we opened a, a, own a gym called Pinellas Ultimate Strength House, or PUSH, in Tampa, Florida. And um, my passion for fitness just kept growing deeper and deeper. And that's when I found competing in 2019. And and from there, I just started to keep pouring my heart out into that, into the sport. And soon after, became a coach. And others, uh, if you follow me, then you kind of know my history in the sport and how, what I've been do doing. And um, it's been super exciting. So, well, give of, us a little bit though, because tell us when you turned pro and a little bit about. Cause I think you have a very interesting journey. You know, kind of the lead up to turning pro and then you know qualifying for now her third Olympia. Yeah. So she's already qualified for the Olympia for this year, but talk a little bit about that. Like what was that journey like for you and what did you learn along the way? Yeah. So I started competing in 2019 with a, with a smaller coach, um, a good friend that I met in our exercise physiology program. And he was a great first coach at the time, still one of the smartest people that I know and kind of took me as far as I could go. Um, in 2020, I was doing a lot of national shows and I won the overall at the Tampa pro and, um, at that overall, I was still the only one that year that didn't get their pro card. Um, and at the time, I, I was clearly upset, but I knew that I wasn't ready to be a pro yet. Um, and that's when I hired Jamie at the end of 2020. And first thing she said is we need to get healthy and we need to take time off. And that that's hard. You know, as competitors, we all want to be on stage. We all want to um, to be showing our hard work. Um, off seasons are tough. And it was really the first time that I was challenged with a long term off season since starting. Um, and something that you said to me, which we talk about all the time and something that still sticks to me this day and that I share with all my clients is you know, I want you to be able to turn pro the next time we go on stage. And not only that, I want you to be competitive at the pro level. Um, you know, there's nothing worse than, you know, kind of getting that pro card and then just being told once again that you have to go back into an off season. She's like, why don't we just take that time now to really progress? And we did. And we took a 16 month off season by the time I got back on stage and um, <laughs> we were prepping for uh, DC Pro-Am. And at the time we were a week out from girl power in 2022 and I saw my photos and I'm like, why not? Let's just ask her if we can maybe do a show. It's only an hour away, whatever. So I checked in with you and I was like, Hey, what do you think about the show? So we did. And she was like, yeah, sure. You know, let's, let's go you just be reasonable about your expectations. So we went, I was reasonable about my expectations and we ended up taking first place and we were one point away in the overall. Um, and then after we went to go get our feedback and Sandy was like, Hey, I don't know what you're doing in a couple of weeks, but I think you should be a junior USA. And that was not on our radar. Once again, that was not the plan. And we ended up going and, um, we got our pro card there as well. So 
it was a really exciting time and literally everything that we talked about and that we uh, manifested and then we, we set out for happened. And um, it, it just goes to our my hard work and, and your coaching and your eye um, that we were that successful that season. And then obviously picked up our first Olympia qualification a few months later, which was a, a huge surprise. Yeah. And, and now three time Olympia qualified. Right. Because you're qualified for this year. Yeah. That's so, so crazy to think about. Yeah. Um, that, that show was completely unexpected. And um, again, it just I think it goes to. My that, that show, to, uh, just in case everybody doesn't know what show, go. What is that show? That was the Hurricane Pro um, at the end of last season, so 2023. We did it just because I was lean. And again, it was it was 20 minutes from home, so why not? And uh, we were up against some really top Olympians, Phoebe Hannigan, Ari, and and it was it was just such an awesome day. You know, we we talked about that right before stage. You know, Jamie checked me and she's like, "You are on." And we know that when Jamie says you're on, you're on. And um, that, again, that, that just goes to my willingness, I think, to take the off seasons and keep improving. And um, that's how we continue to get better in this sport. And I love that, that. I wanted to delve into this because our subject for today is the importance of, of an improvement season. And that, that, that was your idea for the topic. And I think it's a great idea because I do feel like so frequently, like you just said, people want to get back on stage, back on stage, back on stage. And that's not where the improvements happen. So if we keep competing, we don't have that time to actually help ourselves get back into hormonal health, the mental break, putting on the muscle, things like that. So um, so I love that we're talking about this today and what are the benefits of, of taking an improvement season. And obviously as a coach, this is something that you encounter a ton with your athletes as well. Um, so, I mean, let's just dive right into the topic and, and talk a little bit about, you know, how do you know when it's time to take a break and jump into an improvement season? Ugh. I would say two things, the physical and the mental. Uh, for me, most of the time, it's the mental. We battle with that a lot, you know. Um, as pros and even as amateurs, we can go for a really long time in prep and staying at that lean, lean body fat. And that is really hard mentally, you know, if you have a family, if you have kids, if, um, you know, work, things like that. Um, so if you feel like you're maybe, you know, feeling that brain fog or maybe the passion is just not there anymore mentally, or you're kind of getting that imposter syndrome, which I get a lot, you know, as an athlete, it's really important to understand when to push and when to pull back. Um, so when I start feeling kind of mentally down or if I'm cheating on my diet or, you know, something of that nature, I know the season's over. It's time it's time for that mental break. Physically, you know, is your body responding still? Are you still able to stay stage lean? Is your recovery really terrible? Um, are, are you needing to make improvements? Like if your feedback is to, is to be building and making improvements, you cannot do that, unfortunately, in season. You have to take some time to eat and regain that hormonal control and get back in the gym. Um, so to me, if you're getting, you know, multiple signs of feedback of grow, 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 it just cut it down now, you know, don't waste any more time. The, the longer that you keep competing, the more time you're putting that off to make improvements. So just go right into that improvement season and start getting working on it right away. But then you have to deal with the, but I'm so close mindset. <laughs> I'm so close. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, that it's, it's kind of a lie. And in, in this sense is that you're so close, yeah, based on your last show, but you don't know who's going to be at the next show that's going to get you over the top yeah. um, or to that, whatever that objective is. So how, how do you manage that mindset of, I mean, what, what's your trick to doing it? Because um, I, I think that, you know, you listed mindset, physical, I think those are absolutely top two, but there's a third component, which is who's in your trusted circle, um, whether it's a coach or a family member or somebody who's, who's actually giving you that perspective of, Hey, you know, let, let's, you know, come to, come to reason here, but how do you, deal with that and then I'll, I'll say how do you coach it yeah that and and that's a great point you know like as an athlete and a coach myself people ask me a lot especially amateurs like why are you a coach and you have a coach yourself and it's because as an athlete i can't look at myself objectively i don't see sometimes what she sees in me you know, in my photos, I'll pick myself apart and I'll think I'm not lean enough. You know, you go back through your photos of when you were lean and you thought on that day you weren't lean enough. And that really is truly the prep goggles. Um, so the way that I manage it is to rely on Jamie to tell me where she thinks we need to be in order to keep improving. Um, if I don't have that feedback, then I would probably keep myself on stage because I'm an athlete and I'm competitive. But if I have someone and the judges in my corner telling me, hey, in order to make improvements, like we need to do this, 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 
I'm going to do it. I am definitely the athlete that Jamie told me to go eat rocks tomorrow. I'm eating rocks. So um, it's it's just about, you Did know. Did you look at what's in your plan for tomorrow? Because <laughs> I know, maybe <laughs> I do. Gosh, maybe I just <laughs> spoke too soon. Just spoke and too it's soon. Got, it's got to be, uh, it's got to be a granite rock. Exactly. <laughs> They have special like what's going on with Jordan's team? Yeah. I don't know <laughs> <laughs> what type of rock. <laughs> Um, but I've been on both sides of like, you know, just like you said, showing up and being so close. That's where I was in 2020. I just kept showing up and I thought I was so close and I thought I was so close, but really it just depends on who's showing up and, and what's going on that day. I would rather keep improving and know when I show up, I'm undeniable. And maybe even being undeniable that day still isn't the pro card or still isn't the pro win that you're looking for, but you know, you did everything possible to improve and show up your best that day. And if you're showing up and you're like, maybe I could have done an improvement season. Maybe I could have dieted harder. Maybe I shouldn't have, you know, uh, didn't do those 10 extra minutes of cardio. You're leaving room on the table. And, and Jay, I, I, I want to, I'm glad you used that word undeniable. And mm -hmm. that's I uh, I don't like that word. <laughs> and, and, and we've talked about this. So yeah. I, I, and it's not that I don't like that word I, because I do like that word, but I think it's gotta be properly placed. Absolutely. So if you're talking about undeniable, meaning you are going to win, you're in the wrong sport right. because you don't control who wins. So yep. the judges, that's the judge's job and also who else shows up and how they look. But the undeniable that you're talking about is that I know I have done everything going into this stage presentation that I could do. I'm undeniably leaving every, I've, I've done everything that could be done. And when you say undeniable, I mean, I think that's what you mean that's by that. That's exactly but, okay. what I mean. Yeah. Exactly what I mean. You know, like when I step on stage that day, I want to know that I did everything possible. And from there, it's up to the judges. I can't control what their decision is or how anybody shows up. I can only control myself. Um, and again, a part of that is improvement seasons. And I work with clients all the time and I'm huge on improvement seasons, but I also understand that competitive mindset. So it's really just tapping into what your mindset is that day and or what you're feeling in that time and trying to honor and respect that that boundary of yourself of what you're feeling, what your coach thinks you need, and then what you're willing to do and able to do at that time. And undeniable in that mind frame that we're talking about, Greg, is is different for everybody and what how they want to show up their best that day. Yeah, I love that. Um, one of the things I know we've talked quite about quite a bit about recently and I think would help people to understand is that a, the the approach and the mindset that people bring to competing is the make or break yeah and um you know what you're talking about a lot of times you know people are using the stage as a dieting technique or as their motivation to stay in the gym and if somebody's interested in this in the long haul turning pro maybe someday stepping on the olympia stage the approach the mindset approach being that of this is a lifestyle for me because you would never have made the kind of improvements you did during that long improvement season had you not stayed just as focused and dedicated in a different sort of way as you would if you were taking a prep it, i mean you you know i think it's important to talk about like it's an, an improvement season doesn't mean we're just sitting down and relaxing and eating Correct. whatever we want so Correct. like talk a little bit about you know your mental approach to it and then also like the kind of dedication that you've put into you know whether it be for yourself and or your athletes into you know really creating that lifestyle so that when you do go back to prep it's a it's a different ball game yeah yeah and i think I think it starts with honestly at uh, New Year's resolutions, right? I don't really look at it as a New Year resolution when it's the end of the year, I start writing out goals and I, I separate my goals into different categories as an athlete, as a wife, um, as a business owner, as a coach and prefer personal, like, what do I want to accomplish? What do I want to buy this year? What kind of vacation do you want? What, what I what want to do? And I lay this all out there. And my goal each year is to try to keep cross checking, mm -hmm. you know, those different goals. So in an off season setting, obviously, Let's back up when you're in an in-season setting, your your major goal is getting on that stage, right? You have that show date in mind and you're 20 weeks out and you're just ticking along those weeks and that's your major goal. But when you're in off-season, you lose that. And that's where a lot of people start to go wrong in the off-season. Well, coach, I don't have a show in mind, so why am I working you know, just as hard now? And it's the simple term of champions are made in the improvement season, right? It's That is where you are laying that foundation that the next time you step on stage to be your best. And I think a lot of the time people feel about 
it the opposite way. Um, and, and it's really, really, really important to establish your goals as an athlete in that improvement season. You want to grow your glutes. You want to grow your shoulders. You want to stay X amount of body fat. Those are all great goals, but also in the off season, again, it's your time to find that mental flexibility and that balance so that you can have those long-term in seasons as well. In my off seasons, of course, I have very, very structured training and my intensity is very high and things like that. But I also try to push this one off to the side a little bit and start working on my business goals and um, increasing my coaching business and taking care of the relationship with my husband that, you know, eight months out of the year, I have to kind of put that off to the side. So basically all the things that I put off to the side in prep now become more of a prevalence in prep. And I try to find that balance. And if you can find those smaller goals along the way and maybe focusing or shifting your focus on things that you can kind of attain daily outside of bodybuilding, it makes the day to day of that long mundane off season a lot better and you still feel successful. Um, and for some clients, it means small goals as well. Like, you know, during the week, you know, they want to hit their water goal. Like they are so strict with their water goal in season and then they just can't figure it out in off season. Well, make that one of your smaller goals in your off season. But it is, it's about not just taking a step back. In my opinion, if you are a true athlete in this sport and you're trying to you know, really go up the ranks in this sport, you're in season all the time. Um, just at different phases, are, is food higher, cardio lower, training intensity is higher, and then other things we're trying to cut down and it's a little bit more strict and things like that. But you should have that mentality of you're an athlete 24 seven. Every decision that you make adds up at the end of the day. And it's going to make up that goal when you're on stage in four months, six months, a year from now. Um, what you do today is gonna amount to that time the next time you step on stage. An interesting observation when you were going through this is you didn't talk a lot about food. No. And I think that's a real positive thing. And I've watched you. I think you're a really good example of somebody who comes out of a, a, out of a competition season and gives yourself some flexibility around the food that's not over the top. And right. I and I do think part of that, like you evolving into this, I'd say like maturity in the sport and the way in your approach to things is that you'll enjoy the food, but it's not your focus and it's I, not a driver i think that's a mistake a lot of people make is that throughout their prep they're just focused on all the food they're going to have afterwards and and things like that to where you know it becomes you know it, i do think it's important to have flexibility when we're in improvement season like you said so that when we come back into prep we're, we're motivated and ready to go how how have you how have you developed that skill because i really think that this skill is one of the most challenging for people to to really embrace and develop and then implement and then and then be able to, in your case, ultimately teach it to your athletes. Like how did you evolve into that type of, of maturity around the, the food aspect? Yeah, I uh, trial and error. You know, I've had some no reverses. I've had bad reverses. I have to say this past season is the best reverse I've ever had. And it just comes with time and learning from my mistakes that I've had in the past. The first, um, the first improvement season or reverse I did, I didn't have a reverse. I completely blew it. And then I, I gained 25 to 30 pounds of body fat like that. Okay. I don't want to do that again. Take notes and try to do, you know, do better the next time. Um, this season. So this would be my fourth improvement season since competing. The goal was just different this time. You know, when you start to really do well in this sport or when it becomes your passion, again, you want your actions every day to reflect that goal, whether I'm in season or not. Um, so when I started my improvement season this time, I had a goal, a date on the calendar for my reverse. And it was December 15th after the Olympia. It was eight weeks after the Olympia. And I told you I really wanted to stay as strict as I could until that date as we were slowly bringing food up. And we stayed pretty lean during that time. We were only about five to seven pounds up from stage weight on December 15th. And then I started to have some more flexibility, which I need. I'm a type of person that I need that flexibility in the off season to be able to, when Jamie pulls a trigger on my next prep, then I'm in at a hundred percent. Um, so me allowing myself to have that flexibility, but keep it reasonable, keeping it reasonable is huge. The food's not going anywhere. I've had those shows where I had a backpack full of cookies and cakes and everything I've ever wanted waiting for me right after the show. And I would go back into my room and binge. I never left feeling good. I never left feeling satisfied. It only put me into a deeper hole. And I told myself, I don't want to do that again. So the next show, I wouldn't bring a backpack of treats and I would just go and enjoy, et cetera. And what's funny about this recent reverse is it was the most strict I've ever been post-show, but the most satisfied I've ever felt. I could look at a cookie and eat half of it and be satisfied versus grabbing two cookies. And I was very shocked at myself, but it's, it's just learning 
learning and trial and error of what works and what doesn't, what makes you feel good, and then learning from those mistakes along the way. This is the best improvement season I've had. This is the leanest I've ever been in this far into improvement season and the most really um, improvements we've made muscular wise as well and the most healthy I've been in an improvement season. And it really just goes down to all of those small daily choices that I make every day that add up. So I would just really say trial and error. You're gonna probably mess up your first reverse as an athlete. You know, as coaches, we try our best to give you guys, um, you know, the tools and the warning signs and things like that. But listen, with every failure, you're gonna learn how to be successful. Well, that's not necessarily true. A failure. <laughs> well, no, you're right. With every failure, you're, you you have the opportunity to learn. That's true. But at the and what it differentiates what the, the description that you just gave, which I think is really important to hone on, is that, look, failure is going to happen. Yeah. Um, it's going to happen even in the best of circumstances. It only becomes a real failure if you fail to apply right. the lesson. And that's where you distinguish yourself, Jordan, is that you are you are failing and learning. Failing. And that's just, uh, by the way, that's a, an analog for life. Human nature. Um, but yes, exactly. Because, <laughs> yeah. it, and it is. I mean, the, you know, what's the definition of insanity is, you know, we all know what that is. But we prefer a different approach to that, which is if you don't like your results, change your approach. Change your approach. Mm -hmm. And that is a application of the lessons learned through failure. Yeah. Um, um, you hit on something that I really think is important, which is decoupling food from fun and also that scarcity versus abundance mindset. And I think that, you know, we've talked about scarcity and abundance a little bit, but um, I, I and, and as it applies, we've, we talk about it as it applies to clients. Um, you know, look, if you operate like, and I always give the, uh, my metaphor is the prison cafeteria where you got your food around, <laughs> you got your arm around the food, and yeah. I'm going to protect mine. And it, when you are operating out of that mindset and that scarcity mindset with food, especially if you have a restrictive diet, um, it is very easy to drift into that man when I get that opportunity I, I'm, I'm gonna take right I'm gonna take it and and so I think talk just a little bit about your process about getting over that scarcity mindset into the because you said it in the second part which is when you have a cookie you didn't feel like you had to have the whole cookie you you were satiated with half of it um, so something you did you changed inside of yourself mentally to be able to embrace the Hey, there's 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 more instead of if there's not more and there there's a the science around that decision making is loss aversion people will will much avoid a decision that avoids the loss right. more than they will embrace the decision that em empowers the gain and and so i think talk me and i'm sorry i'm talking too much no talk no, no that's a, that's exactly actually my point of view is it's I, listen, I love food. I'm a foodie. Jamie just ate sushi with me on Sunday. She knows how much I can eat. But there, are, there's a time and a place for things, right? If you're going to every free meal or every untracked meal or whatever, approaching every day within your macros and it's an, a free for all, that's a little bit of a, of a mental issue, right? That's a deeper issue that needs to be looked at. Um, I think when you approach it of, okay, I want to have a cookie right now, right? You're having that, that urge. You want that cookie. Allow yourself to have that one cookie and then walk away. And if you really want a second cookie, what I try to tell my clients is just give it some time. Give it 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and see if that urgency is still there. Is it emotional or is it hunger? And most times it's just emotional or it's just a want versus a need, and that urge will slowly decrease. And that's what I noticed about myself. You know, I went into the, the binging episodes and I was just going into, well, you know, screw it. I want two cookies. And then I was like, did I really need the two cookies? I actually felt guilty after. Did so you then, even really want the Did two I even really cookies? want yeah. it? And then so when I started to notice these, these own patterns in myself, I'm like, okay, so I'm noticing this pattern now. How do I fix it? Let's change, let's change the behavior. Let's change the intent. So if I want two cookies, I'm going to start with one and then I'm going to walk away. And most times I didn't go back for the second one. And my mindset was I was proud of myself. So I wasn't guilty mm -hmm. anymore. And I wasn't feeling the physical illness of eating two cookies. I was proud because I was able to walk away and I still felt mentally and physically satisfied. And it took several rounds of this, you know, and sometimes I did go back for two cookies. Like, you know, sometimes you just do. And yeah. you, you once again, you're reminded that wasn't the best choice, but it's, Honestly, it's just about being real with yourself and really keeping in tune with that that monologue of is this a want or is this emotional? And and 
learning the difference. Sometimes you just want two cookies and that's okay in improvement season. You've got to allow yourself that flexibility or then you start to get that scarcity mindset and that's what causes even more issues and binging and things like that. But it shouldn't be like that all the time. Right. That's you just falling into that that mental hurdle that needs to be looked at deeper. Yeah. And the behavior, I'm sorry, just let, I'll just say this real quick. The behavioral aspect that you're talking about, which we've talked about before, is creating space between stimulus and response. Yes. So stimulus is I want four cookies, two cookies, whatever. Yep. Response is eat the cookies. Right. And and creating that space allows you that opportunity to make a choice Correct. rather than to be driven by a compulsion. Correct. Correct. And I think a lot of people don't, they, they bypass that emotion because they're just so obsessive of what the want is at that time. Or what the need, or what the perceived need is. Correct, yeah. and that's where you really start to know about yourself is when you kind of take a step back and just look at the bigger picture of everything. And it's just, it's continuing to learn about yourself and learn what triggers you and learn what, has food always been an issue for you? Before competing, I didn't even like sweets. Like I would have like one, I, I loved fats, I loved cheese and things like that. And now I don't even want those things now. I want like dessert and cookies. It's, it's interesting how, you know, things change when your body doesn't get the things that you that you used to have in the past um but it, it's it's just constantly learning that behavior about yourself and again change changing your approach yeah absolutely and i loved when you said that the food's always going to be there because i know for me that was something i would remind myself and you know people get into that scarcity mindset like you said with a backpack full of sweets when we know there's going to be more than enough temptation around let's not add to it but i wanted to i wanted to kind of jump over into the hormonal side of things when we're talking about this because i do think it's very empowering to understand what's going on in your body when you've been dieting over a long period of time and your brain is not getting the proper signals. So like, talk to us a little bit about that side of things. Cause I think just even educating the people that are listening on what's going on, that's creating that drive for food and that, like, I just finished eating, but I want to eat more. And that like, it's almost like that panic and anxiety around, around that, you know, where, you know, where that feeling's coming from. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really great point. We, we neglect to talk about that post show that a lot of the feelings of hunger actually is not hunger. It's hormones. Um, and there's two main hormones in our body, leptin and ghrelin and leptin is produced in fat cells. And that is what tells your body, Hey, I'm full. Like we're done. Uh, and then ghrelin, I call it the gremlin, like a monster, right? The <laughs> um, is what says I'm hungry. So when we're in a in a uh, co competition season and we're really low on body fat, leptin is also bottomed out. So that normal hormone that says, "Hey, I'm full," we don't have enough of it. But ghrelin is now produced on overdrive. Um, so it's it's this really fine balance post show of like, am I really hungry or am I full? I don't know. And it's frustrating. It is so frustrating for athletes because, you know, I could get their food super high, but they're still hungry and they know their food is high and they don't understand that it's the hormone telling them not the actual physical sensation. And post show, that's why it is super important to follow that reverse diet. Your body is so sensitive at that time. There are so many different hormonal aspects and internal changes that are going on so just like we slowly cut and slowly increase um cardio we have to do the opposite to give your body the chance to find that homeostasis and balance back out um so it i would say for me that my hunger cues usually are not even manageable until about eight to ten weeks post-show which is why you made the decision to do the eight weeks of being a little more strict knowing that you're not going to be able to rely on those proper hunger and satiation cues correct yeah it's it's it was me trying to develop develop trust within myself again i knew that if i didn't do that reverse and tell you that and we came up with this way before the olympia i wanted you to know and i wanted you to know our plan off the bat because i knew i couldn't trust my own hunger cues post show from recent preps um and about at that eight to ten week mark, like I said, it was it was more much more leveled, but it was it was still off. Um, so it's really important, I think, at that time to make that commitment to yourself, whatever it is, six to eight weeks, um, and then make sure that you kind of keep that 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 commitment to yourself, so that you give yourself the best opportunity to stay full and satisfied. Yeah, and I love I love that you talked about that because I do think being patient with yourself during that time is so important. And and I think about, um, you know, one of the preps I was on where I had done a lot of shows back to back and that the hunger cues were completely off. This is one of those places where I wish somebody would have told me, hey, let's shut it down. You need a little bit of a break. Um, I do think that sometimes 
athletes get into a situation where they feel like they're worried they're going to become irrelevant if they take a break and things like that. Um, and I know that for me in that particular one, I, and I think I've shared this with you, I, I, I ate like an entire Costco bag of green beans that I had cooked really crisp <laughs> to pretend like they were French fries. Yeah. These were a lot. <laughs> and I was physically in pain, but mentally I was still, my brain was still saying to eat. I'm hungry. Yep. And so understanding those mechanisms I think is, is really, really important. And then, um, you know, also giving, you know, you've talked a lot about not using these words, but, you know, giving yourself grace. grace. If you want the two cookies, eat the two cookies rather than beating yourself up, which is then going to potentially, you know, drive you right back into it. Um, but let's talk about that that thought that some people do have of, of feeling like they're worried about becoming irrelevant. Like, t talk a little bit about that, because you stepped away at a point where you had some really good momentum going. And, um, you know, one of the reasons, you know, we made the decision to do that is because we wanted to create a little more balance in your physique, bring down the legs a little bit, bring up the glutes. We couldn't do that in a, in an, and we wanted to make sure hormone health and mental and everything else was there. But I know that's a scary thing for a lot of people when they have that momentum going. So, um, you know, for yourself and for others that you coach, talk a little bit about, you know, that worry. Yeah. Well, what what kind of momentum, right? Like there's different, th different phases of momentum. Could we have kept going and maybe been in like the top five every time? Yeah, probably. But we wouldn't have had that that well, I, I know we not least you like the word undeniable, but the progressive physique, right? I think judges are more impressed when you take time and you show up and you're like, whoa, she changed versus like, oh yeah, she's 10% improved or yeah, she looks the same as two weeks ago. Cool, cool, cool. Like they want, they, they love when you take their feedback and capitalize on it. And to me, like if you are an athlete that's showing up and keeps improving and has that stage presence and they they have seen you, they are going to remember you. I mean, they, they will remember you. They may not know your name, but they will know your look when you come back. And I think that they are going to have a bigger impression of you by taking that feedback, taking what they told you to do and showing up with that feedback and even an improved package on that. That to me is more momentum than just staying on stage and making five to 10% improvements every show, um, especially for some that needs to grow so and and with those type of improvements as well now your momentum's even gonna just take off you know i think that's what i again contribute so much of my success to is with 16 months of not being on stage but i also stayed relevant in a way that i kept going to shows i still showed up at shows i still saw the judges i still was watching and studying my sport that year and i was watching all the live streams and like i said talking to, to other coaches and things like that so i stayed relevant just in a different way and then when i came back as an athlete it wasn't like anybody forgot about me but now they're seeing me as an athlete back on stage and that was the year that everything happened but because i took that time to bring my legs down and bring my glutes up and everything that they asked me to do was done um and that's why i thought I was able to kind of climb the ranks fast in the way because I took a little bit of a longer time, but now my improvement seasons have to be shorter because I have made those improvements. So my momentum can kind of keep continuing to progress with breaks along the way as well as needed. Right. Because you don't always have to take a long improvement season. So we're talking about, you know, when we talk about improvement season, I love that you opened it up with, you know, it could be the, you know, physical, the mental, you know, there's the hormonal sides of things. It's, it's kind of, where are you? Because, you know, if you are in season and you're looking good and your momentum is good and you're not getting feedback that you need more improvements, keep going. That's fine. Yeah. You know, and then it's just that constantly checking in with yourself you know, how am I feeling? Are there other areas of my life that need some attention? Those kinds of things, which I think, you know, as driven people that we are, you know, sometimes we can forget to check in on those things and, and those people we care about and things like that, that maybe aren't getting enough of us. So yeah, that's I, a great point because, yeah. because food could be high, body looks good, body's responding, physically, everything's fine but personal life is taking a back seat. Maybe your kids need you, maybe your husband wants more time, your job, whatever that is, that's also a, a time for a break. And that doesn't mean that you have to go 15, 20, whatever pounds over stage, but you can still stay fit relatively lean, take care of whatever needs to be taken care of, and then come back. There's different ways to improve in an improvement season than just the physical. Yeah. And the other thing that was coming to my mind as you were talking is that, um, you know, even people that don't compete, 
Yeah. There's those people, you know, you, you have your gym in Florida yeah. and of course we're in the gyms all the time, but you know, there's those people that year after year they show up, which is great, yeah. but they're not making improvements. So yeah. it's kind of interesting that even, you know, just people who are on just any kind of fitness journey, you know, what does that mean? Whether it be a deload week or, you know, if they're dieting kind of year round, um, you know, what kind of advice would you give to people that aren't necessarily going to step on stage, but are those people that are kind of always pressing forward and yeah. not making the forward progress that maybe they want to make. Yeah, I work with a lot of lifestyle clients all the time and they they just want to be dieting all the time, you know, but there does come a point just like an athlete where the body stops responding, right? There comes a point where food's been low for too long, cardio's been high, um, and the body's just not responding anymore. And that is a time to start a reverse diet, even with a lifestyle client. With a lifestyle client, with any client, you have to go through ebbs and flows of cutting and reversing, cutting and reversing for longevity in this sport. You know, 99% of the time when I'm having a lifestyle client come to me, I'm sure you see this too. They're like, you know, I've been dieting for a year and I'm not seeing any changes the last four mm -hmm. months. Then we get their food plan and they're on, you know, a thousand and nine hundred calories and 60 minutes of cardio a day. And their body is just quite literally burnt out. And then we start to reverse them. And then what happens? They start dropping more weight and they, they are mind blown. They're like, I'm doing less, but I'm gaining more. And that's where a coach can really guide you and help you here. You know, sometimes again, you have to know when to push and when to pull back. If we start feeding that that lifestyle client, their body's dropping again. We know for sure they've been overtraining, or the body's you know having a difficult time. So, it, it's it's again about really really being in tune with your body, you know. And if you feel mentally or physically exhausted, it's time to take a deload week. It's time to bring calories up and just see how the body's respond. And everything can be temporary. You can try something. I try something as a coach all the time. I tell my clients all the time, I'm gonna try this. I don't know if it's gonna work. I'm hoping this is what happens, but it might not. And sometimes it happens and sometimes it don't. We don't, we take a different approach. Um, there's, my famous quote is there's 10 ways to skin a cat as long as the cat gets skin at the end of the day. And, and that is the beauty of fitness is that there's so many ways to help a client that way but yes even in the in the uh, lifestyle and the fitness realm it's important to know that piece as well yeah well that was actually i think a discussion on the coaches chat this week is what well, what are the motivators for somebody who doesn't want to step on stage absolutely and and i think that there were some good sharing of that of, about what approaches to use but um how, how do you approach that um, you actually brought this one up as, you know, buying an outfit, um, a brand new outfit, one to two size smaller mm -hmm. and trying to get into that a outfit. Bowl outfit. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, in my, um, in our exercise physiology, so, sorry, exercise psychology class, we had to come up with like a, a motivation theory and Drew came up with the purchase motivation theory. So if someone buys something, they're more inclined to work toward buying it or to use it like a new pair of tennis shoes, you know, buy a new pair of tennis shoes for cardio, you're going to do it. So, um, I think buying something something like an outfit, something like that, um, small goals along the way, maybe you want to lose a half a pound a week, you know, and on average. So that doesn't mean that you're going to lose a half a pound every week. It means one week you may lose one, one week you may lose none. And then next week you use a half a pound, you know, an, a, a, a scientific or a numbers goal is, is good, but something that is not going to happen every week. So sometimes that, that makes people feel like they're not on track. Mm -hmm. Um, something else as well is I, I like to do more personal goals. You know, yes, we're doing all of these things inside of the gym, but let's do also do a personal goal this mm -hmm. week. Did you get out and, you know, do a mental health day for yourself? You told me in your check-in last week, you wanted to go for a walk on the beach to clear your head. Did you do that? So taking care of other things in your life as well with your bodybuilding goals, I think is, it can make you feel successful completely as, as a fitness individual. Well, and that outfit idea is really Jamie's. Um, <laughs> Which all good ideas belong to Jamie, but um, for, <laughs> I don't for know about me, all that. But uh, for me, at least, uh, that that she had a client, and and I will never forget this. This client was was prepping for a wedding. She yeah. wasn't prepping for a show, although a wedding is a show. It is, and yeah. and her goal was to fit into that wedding dress. And Absolutely. I will tell you that. I mean, I know your joy when you won the hurricane. I've seen your joy when you've won your pro shows. I've seen our other athletes when they win the pro shows or when they do well. Um, but this gal that for her fit into our wedding dress, you would have think that she just won the Olympia. I mean, it was just it was it was just because it, that was what was important to yeah. her. And mm -hmm. there's this. Mo notion in sales, bring up Drew's thing, is that um, <laughs> and, and, and the, the theory is called the big red boat, which is a sales manager has an underperforming salesperson and the salesperson, he 
actually starts talking to the person and finds out what's important to them. And what's important to this particular salesperson is uh, he's always wanted a red boat. So the sales manager puts a red boat on his desk. And that little visual motiv motivator of his is just what he needs to keep going through. And yeah. I think what you're talking about is what, and I love that personal aspect of it, is what, what drives you personally? Yeah. Because we can't control always the body. We can affect it and influence it, but we can't always control how it's going to respond. There's just too many variables in, internally and externally. Yeah. But what you can control is, hey, am I going to journal every day? Yep. Am I going to take a walk? Am I going to do something that makes me feel happy? Am I going to do something that makes me feel beautiful? Keeping the head in the game keeps the body in the game. Yeah, yeah. And we, we, we talk about that all the time. Where the mind goes, the body follows, which is why with a lot of my lifestyle clients, it's, it, it is about taking care of the mindset and what that means. Um, you know, insanity is literally the definition of doing the same thing over and over again, expecting the same results. So a lot of lifestyle clients, you know, they're coming to us and they're, you know, they're at their wits end. They've done everything. So it's about changing that behavior and what, what motivates them and what makes them tick so that they can feel successful and making the right choices to change those behaviors so yeah. that they are successful. I, I, and it's very true. Um, it was funny when you just said that when they come to us, a lot of times they've tried everything and then, and then sometimes they're resistant to doing something different. Exactly. So it's, and, and the other, you said something earlier about, you know, trying something new that you maybe haven't done with this particular athlete before and letting them know we're going to see, cause everybody's body's a little bit different yeah. and everybody's mentality around it is a little bit different too. And I think the lesson in all of that, that I'm hearing is being resilient and flexible is an, an important part of your journey, whether you're a lifestyle, you know, athlete, I like to call them both athletes yeah, I mean, you're a, or you're a competitor wanting to get on stage, not being too married to a specific way of doing things or if things deviate on any particular day or hour like being able to then adjust and shift i think is is an important quality yeah. to, to work on um as you're continuing on your journey and and this is what a big part of what i'm hearing from you and that i see from you yeah. is your that that ability to pivot yeah and that's a great point i mean no prep that we've done has been the same right you know and i th we get athletes all the time well my old coach did this okay well you're not with that coach anymore and you left them for a reason, right? So let's try this approach, a different approach. And every prep for us has been different. You know, the body responds a different way, even with how strict an athlete, you know, an Olympian athlete has to be, it's, there's still nuances that have to change along the way. And it's about trusting the coach or trusting the person that's in your corner to guide you through that. Even if it's scary and if it's nothing you've done before, it could not work. What's the worst that can happen? It doesn't work. Right. But what's the a good thing that can happen? It could be a mind blowing change to your physique that you wouldn't have known unless you tried it. So that's where you just really have to rely on your coach or that person that's guiding you and just sit back along the way and be, be flexible. You, uh, you inspired something in me today, and I learned something. Uh, we, we have embraced, I have embraced the phrase improvement season over off season simply because we want the person to embrace that that notion that you described. You're not off. That's right. You're not yes, off. You're not Champions off. are made in, in the improvement oh. season. But now I, well, I started to rethink that as we we're having this, this conversation because I thought, well, but what if an athlete needs an off season? Just a period of time where they can say, I am off. Yeah. Not, not to go off the rails, not to go outside of boundaries, to stay reasonable, but just mentally we embraced improvement season because of that neuro-linguistic programming aspect of it that it connotes something that, hey, you still need to live this lifestyle. But now what I have expanded that view now is we've talked about this and now I'm kind of embracing this fact that maybe if somebody does need that phrasing of off season just to reset, then don't be afraid of that. Yeah. Yeah. Some people need, you know, to take time away from tracking. That's a big one. You know, yeah. some people just need to remove the numbers aspect, remove the meal plans and just try intuitive eating. It's hard with newer athletes because they're still learning food and they're still learning their macros and things and things of that nature. But with a more seasoned athlete, and this is something that Jamie and I tried this year, we have done some more intuitive eating. And and but she trusts me. She's given me two to three improvement seasons to know that I understand food and I can eyeball food and things like that. So if it's it, sometimes again, it's about learning when to pull back. But individually for that athlete, what does that mean? Hey, I'm totally fine to, you know, pull back on macro tracking and things like that, but maybe we just still stick with a protein goal, yeah. you know, so just, just pulling back a little bit to give them a little bit more autonomy, but also keep them on, on plan. Accountable. And, and yeah. Jay, we, we, we're running out of time, but there is something, no, it's good. This is, this is a great discussion. <laughs> I, I want to talk about, so we've talked a little bit about nutrition, lifestyle, personal 
professional, all, all those aspects of it. But um, I want to talk a little bit about the training aspect. Okay. Because especially as a professional athlete, and I think Jamie talked to you about this, you had things that you wanted to work on yeah. in your improvement season. And what I see with a lot of people is when they get improvement season, you know, they may be good on their macros. They may be good on these other dimensions in their life, but the training just kind of wanes yeah. like either either in one of two ways either one um they say okay time to go beast mode and they forget that compound movements are not what my body needs to <laughs> improve um or or they or they just totally go you know i'm just going to check the, check the block mindset which is i'm just going to the gym because it's on my schedule but i'm not being purposeful or intentional about training it yeah. and we know that improvement season is where the shaping where the growing where the real intense workouts should be yeah um and, and or and reducing muscle in certain that, that's right yeah. that's right yeah. so so how do you approach that yeah well the the number because one you have you do have a beast mode I attitude do. I which do. is not a bad thing yeah but you have to tame that beast mode i and, do and so talk there's a balance yeah. there is a balance there is a balance the first thing that comes to mind is it's always shocking to me when a client finishes their show and they don't want to coach in their off season again that's when the champions made right and that's when in my opinion you need to coach more than ever right it's, it's not easy to get lean but it's easier to get lean versus make those improvements um so with the training piece, it's number one, it's training your body, like really understanding your feedback and what you need, right? So for some people, that means that they do need those heavy compound movements. And they need to be more real with themselves if they're truly training at an intensity that's appropriate for them. A check back box mindset, you know, just going in, here's my plan, check, 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 12 check. reps done. Yep, yeah. and they're done. Um, that is probably not gonna get you to where you need to be. There's also the opposite, like you said, where someone's going into the gym and maybe not even following the plan that their coach had given them. You know, they saw something cool on Instagram or um, it happens all the time. And we're like, why are you training that? You know, um, when I went to Jamie, my feedback was I needed to bring my quads down, we needed to bring glutes up and we just needed to build everywhere. I have not done a knee flexion extension exercise since I started competing because of that. And we were able to bring my quads down quite a bit. I think when I started the sport, I was 23 and a half inches in my quad and in season, I'm 19, somewhere around there. So we have done a lot of work in that department. Um, that So learning what movements specifically your body needs to train, being real with yourself on the appropriate intensity, and also really understanding within the bikini criteria, please remember this is the smallest muscular category in our women female divisions so when you are in those higher ranks unfortunately your training becomes very very specific and for some people a little boring right you're you're just really shaping and taking a very eye and fine detail and i think that's where people miss a lot they have the muscle they have the the density and then they're just keep training those compound movements now they're blowing out their waist they they've overgrown in certain areas they're finding that imbalance and they're pigeonholing themselves. And that's where it's just really important for you to continue to study the sport. Always go back to the to who won the uh, Olympia. That is our standard for the year. And really be real and honest with yourself from up to down what you need to improve on. And most of the time in the bikini criteria, it's not necessarily the way that you want to train. And maybe that's something to take into consideration. That's why a lot of w women uh, went the wellness route when the wellness route first came because they wanted to be able to train hard good for them that's a personal choice and that's a kind of where you got to know you know how how far you want to take this and making that right decision for yourself as far as training goes i love so much that you went there because i know i literally uh, had somebody ask me yesterday am i going to get a new training protocol every four weeks and this is a an, an advanced athlete that really has enough muscle everywhere except we're just working on a little bit of upper glute work well once we get to that point I have very limited on the exercises I can give that athlete because, you know, I don't want her to grow more shoulders, for example, because her shoulders are already really built. So I know that, you know, sometimes, you know, a lot of us fall in love with training because training is, is fun to us and, you know, there's so much we get out of it. And if it's something you're wanting to do to progress, sometimes that's going to mean Less. more limited. Less is more. Yeah. Yeah. Which is an interesting shift to yeah. have to make mentally and a lot of clients too they they have the mindset of my training block should 
switch every four weeks. I tell my clients off the jump, I'm a big fan of progressive overload. Once we get your style of training, the first two weeks is about you know, really dialing in that training for that athlete, what they like, what they feel, uh, what they have access to. And then we keep it for a prolonged period of time, anywhere from 18 to 20 weeks, as long as you're still progressing. I tell people the story all the time. Uh, 2022, we started um, prepping January 1st. We got done December 17th at the Olympia. My workouts changed once. And when I say my workouts change, it was like accessory movements. My meat and potatoes movements and my compound movements stayed the same. Why? Because they worked. They're working. Why are we going to change something that's working? Now, if you're bored of something, whatever, that's a different case. But well, and if, if you're a lifestyle, then then right, fine. Well, I also think that one of the primary drivers for or the impetus for change now is Instagram. Yes. P people will see something on Instagram and say, and and we talk about this all the time. Is that look? It's the foundational movements. It, it, it's it's part of the program that we're doing with Drew, which is these assessments. Is that it's build a foundational. If you're going to build a house, you don't start by building the walls. You don't start by building the roof. You start by building the foundation. Yeah. And it is better to do fundamental exercises correctly. Correct. Than it is to introduce these wild kind of gymnastic oriented, hey, it takes me five minutes just to set up the equipment to do this maneuver that is a Cirque du Soleil kind of, you know, I am, am I auditioning for Cirque du Soleil or am I trying to be a bikini competitor? <laughs> right. Which one? Right. And, and I see that all the time and it frustrates me. Well, also, yeah. what, let me yeah, add one yeah. thing to that for our listeners, because I know we're running out of time and I think this is a really important point. I've had athletes that I coach that are also influencers, have big followings, they post a lot, things like that. And I'll see them post something, and not everybody does this, but I just wanna say, and I'll say, that's not on your plan. And they'll go, oh, uh. I was just doing that for the gram. I just, you know, because because it's boring if they keep posting the same workouts all the time. So sometimes they'll change it up just for variety for their followers and things like that. And then people who religiously follow certain people think, oh my gosh, that's something now I, I have need to do, to that. do. When in reality, that's not even really one of the exercises that that athlete's doing. So I just want to put that out there. Yeah. Because and, I do and, think it's important to like measure what you're seeing and how you're implementing that in your own absolutely right and and there's no, and by the way so we're clear we're not critical of that no, no, no we're not critical of that and in fact i've discovered a lot of interesting ways of approaching different movement tech movement planes and profiles that i would not have thought of so there is value in it but you have to approach it and embrace it with an open mind and just yeah. don't believe everything yeah. you see yeah. is, right. is what i'm saying yeah. yeah what i always tell you guys too what i tell my staff at push and at the gym is you know i'll see something that they're doing and exercise they're putting a client through and maybe i don't know the exercise or understand the why at the time so i'll challenge the trainer why are you doing that and as long as you have a good reason right a good reason a foundation for something i'm open to anything but you have to have a reason behind it so and i've had so many athletes come to me and tell me certain things i'm like why are you doing that yeah and they 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 it, can't it answer the cool. question. It looks the, cool. The funny, right. the funny part of this is that in the corporate world, which is part of our world as well, I, I always had that thing of if you're doing a process if for work and working for large corporations that we have, um, if you're doing a process for work and you don't know why you're doing it, then we need to either train you better or we need to figure out, I, I ask myself the question, why are we doing right. that? Because right. maybe we don't need to do that. Why would you be motivated right. to keep doing it if you right. don't know the why? Right. I, that's my coaching philosophy. I tell my clients all the time, if you don't know why, we're doing something i'm not ask. doing my job ask because that's going to make you more inclined to do it agreed mm -hmm. agreed all right well i think we've gone over time but it was so worth it and i know we're going to do another episode with jordan i'm sure we'll have her back many times because you really have so much to share and of course talk before we let you go talk about how people can get a hold of you, whether it be for coaching to watch you also have your own podcast. So talk a little bit about that. Sure. So um, you can find me for coaching on the Fit Body Fusion website, fitbodyfusion.com. And you can request a consultation with me. My Instagram is at J-A-Y-Y Brannon underscore IFBB pro. My name is Jordan Brandon. You can also search it that way. I am uh, hosting another podcast called Behind the Bikini with Sean Hector Lewis as well, which you can find on YouTube. Um, and those are my main outlets. You can find me on one of those. And it shows. Aw. Because you're you're very you're very present at shows, and I've been fortunate enough to capture some pictures of you and how what an engaged coach you are. And and I do want to give you a compliment before we sign off, which is this: is that I know a lot of athletes are concerned about having a coach who's a competitor, and that's a legitimate concern. Absolutely. Um, but what I can assure them with you is that your first priority is always your athletes. Yes. And I have seen <laughs> that. I have seen that in person. This is not. 
I'm just not saying this. I'm saying leaders lead by example, and you're a leader, and you do that. I've seen you at shows where you're competing, and you're more concerned about your athletes than you are about yourself. I got to drag you over to take care of yourself. <laughs> it's true. That's the best compliment. Well, yes. you're, you're, you. you're one of the best people we know on the planet. So um, okay. let's get to your checked out word. And uh, we started with excitement. Where are we at? Grateful. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to stop. Yeah. That's a great way to stop. And please, 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 I, I, I feel weird asking for this, um, but it, it does help if you like and subscribe uh, to, to this podcast. And um, review. And review it. And share. Um, and, and share. <laughs> and we do read the reviews. So if there are questions or items that you do want to see, it is helpful to have that. Um, and it's just part of the process of like and subscribe. It's a couple clicks and a few strokes of the key, keypad. You're, you're good to go, right? <laughs> Thank you guys All for right, having everybody. me. All right, everybody. Remember the three Bs. Be safe, be good to yourself, and be good to one another. Till next time. Till next time. Thank you for tuning in to Fit Body Lifestyle. We hope today's episode has left you feeling motivated and equipped to tackle your fitness goals, business challenges, and the daily dance of life. Remember to value progress over perfection. Life's tough enough alone. Find the chosen family around you to help you along the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe and leave us a review on your favorite streaming platform. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram at FitBodyFusion.